Well, I've come out of a research facility here at the University of Georgia full of tanks where amphibians are. Don't have my mask on anymore, fully vaccinated and doing well, but I'm hanging out with a colleague and friend who studies reptiles and amphibians. And I want to tell you about why it's important to know a guy like Dr. John Mayers. Dr. Mayers? How are you, Nate? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm good. Well, good. So Dr. Mayers is also fully vaccinated, and I'm assuming your buddy here is as well. Doc, could you tell us in your work as a herpetologist about this little fella you're holding and its conservation status in Georgia, which is where we're going to go today in our segment. Sure. Well, um, Georgia is an amazing place because we have an incredible diversity of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, it's a big part of our natural heritage. And one of the things that we're trying to do here at the University of Georgia is um, understand and help conserve some of the salamanders and frogs that are in decline. And for example, this guy here, this is a gopher frog. Um, it is arguably our rarest frog in the state of Georgia. Um, there's only uh, really a few uh, good intact populations left in the state. Um, it's a species of greatest conservation need, uh, so it's a priority for the state of Georgia and all the states within the gopher frogs range. And it's also now uh, been petitioned as a candidate for federal protection under the Endangered Species Act. Wow. So this is something that if I've got some land south of the fall line in Georgia there in the southeast, I need to know about this guy. And it's interesting that John's got gloves on, I've got gloves on, just because he's such a protected species and his skin is so sensitive, we're wearing these guys to protect them. John, I want to tell the folks at home where this guy begins his life cycle. I want to go outside with you. And we talked before this today about these big tanks that John has to study these guys in the infancy stage. So let's hop on over there next. Well, take a look around you. What you're looking at is a place for would-be gopher frogs that are gonna be hanging out as babies. And John, I look at this and I think to myself as an uneducated, not knowing much about herpetology at all, this just looks like a bin full of rainwater. Talk to me about this as a habitat. Yeah, so when you look at all of these tanks around you here, you can kind of think of this as our version of recreating a wetland mm. specifically to raise gopher frogs. Mm. And so in each of these tanks are uh, individuals that we introduced as little tiny tadpoles and then we're rearing them up in here with the ultimate goal of releasing them back out into restored habitats in Georgia. So I look at this thing, it's in the blazing sun, it's getting hot now in Georgia. Why no shade, John? I mean, is this something that is okay for them or I'm just concerned about their viability? Well, you've actually touched on to a really important part of gopher this. frog ecology. So. Um, gopher frogs, like a lot of amphibians in Georgia, they actually like um, isolated ephemeral wetlands, the wetlands that tend to dry up every year or two. And they also like those wetlands to be really open. So not a lot of trees and things overhanging them. And that's because when you have that open wetland, what that allows is two things. It allows a lot of sunlight to penetrate. So it warms up the water a little bit. It also promotes a lot of al algal growth and things like that. And when you have a lot of good algal growth, they can grow faster and they can get out of the water before that wetland dries up. The other thing is that when you have that, you know, kind of bright open sunny area, when that wetlands dry, it promotes the growth of a lot of grasses mm -hmm. and herbaceous plants, which are really good fuel when that wetland floods. And, and as you can see, there's bits of grass in yeah. here. And this tank is full of a native grass that we collect from the wetlands here in Georgia. And when that grass starts decomposing in this sunlight, it just creates this perfect growing environment for these tadpoles. And so you can see they get quite large and these guys can grow really, really large and they can complete their whole tadpole cycle in about 100 days if we give them good growing environments. Incredible. I was expecting John to pick out something that was the size of a quarter and this thing is almost the size of a dollar. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> they, they grow remarkably fast to a very large size, which is something really special about the ecology of gopher frogs. It tells us when a tadpole grows this big really fast, it tells us that they're kind of adapted to a world where it's going to dry up. Mm -hmm but it needs to have lots of productivity. It needs to have lots of energy for them to grow that fast. And that's why you need open herbaceous right things. And so that's what we've tried to recreate here on this uh, kind of concrete platform. And you know, Dr. Maris mentioned the grass. This is a special kind of grass. John, you are studying not only the grass, but how quickly these guys grow in different temperatures too? Yeah, well, we're actually looking at two things with regards to temperature. So one, temperature, uh, we've done some research to show that when we shade these systems, it reduces the productivity, it cools them down a little bit, and that reduces their growth. And, oh. it may, and they also tend to be smaller when they come out as juvenile frogs. 
But the other thing that temperature does is it actually can influence whether or not they end up being a boy or a girl. Wow. Yeah, so and so, and because we're using these animals to try and restore populations, we would like to make sure that a good proportion of them are females. And so, um, so we monitor the temperature and we're trying to understand how the temperature environment also influences um, the production of female frogs. And John, who would have known by looking at these bins that all the science that's going on inside of here right now, what I wanna do is I wanna talk to the folks at home next about what they can do to help and things they can do on their property because this is so interesting to see all the things that you're studying here. So let's slither on over there next. <laughs> All right, so what we were just looking at there is a two month old, Dr. Maris was saying, two month old tadpole. How long until that guy's going out in the wild? So in about another month, they will begin to metamorphose and come out. And so there'll be little juvenile frogs, a little bit bigger than your thumb, you could say, okay. um, a little bit thicker. And what will happen then is in this area right now, we'll produce, for example, about hopefully uh, somewhere around 2,000 young frogs, and then we will be taking them to places in Georgia where the habitat's been restored for species like the gopher frog. Um, and what we will do is we will actually track and see how they do, like what their survival rates are like, and if they're finding the kind of appropriate habitats that they need and those kind of things. Wow, and this is all done proactively. This is not a reactionary. You are getting out ahead of the curve, helping these guys. What can folks on their land do to help? So there's a couple really important things. Um, as I mentioned before, these guys need open, mm -hmm. herbaceous, isolated wetlands. And so a lot of times um, we've had this tendency in those wetland areas to just leave them alone and think that leaving them alone is you know, good for the wetland. But actually these wetlands need disturbance. They need ways of getting um, you know, fire into those wetlands when they dry down periodically. We need to keep the herbaceous, or I'm sorry, the, the vegetation like um, shrubs and trees from growing up too much in those wetlands. Okay. And so that's one thing that people can do is, you know, kind of keeping um, wetlands from becoming overgrown with mm. trees and shrubs, uh, allowing natural processes like people who are doing prescribed fire on lands, allowing those fires to burn through those wetlands can be, can be helpful for these animals. And then the other thing is that the areas just surrounding these wetlands, these animals rely on burrows and getting down in the soil. And so they need access to stump holes and mammal tunnels and tortoise burrows and those kind of things. And so having those areas around a wetland where they can find the refugia they need is also really important. That's incredible. We have learned today from Dr. Maris what we can do. We've learned the story of this gopher frog. This has just been really exciting. John, thanks so much for My that. My pleasure, man. I really enjoyed it. I hope you all did too. And you know what to do. While you're online checking out the old Ranger Nick videos on YouTube, check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page and see what we got going on there. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, as I always say, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here next month. See ya.